the DC-10 crash. Well, I was aware that previous years, Air New Zealand had tourist flights over Antarctica. And I thought, here's my chance with my own personal camera to take a great picture of an Air New Zealand DC-10 flying over Antarctica and sell it to Air New Zealand for its publicity. And the first flight of the season was Wednesday the 14th of November. And I went out and I took that picture. It stayed at 16,000 feet above sea level uh, the entire time. Uh, this is uh, Observation Hill with the cross to Robert Falcon Scott and his party on the top of Observation Hill. And that's the plane. On my black and white picture of this, the plane was so indistinct, I had to burn it in, if you know what that means, with uh, black and white. And you give extra time to get this little dot in. Two weeks later, I mean one week later, on the 21st, I was so del disillusioned by this, I, I'm not going to be able to sell a picture like this to Air New Zealand. I was working in the darkroom and the plane came over at 3,000 feet above sea level, flew low up at Murdo Sound, boom, right above the base. I raced out and saw it. I didn't even have my camera. I was ready and waiting on the 28th. Well, something else that happened between the 14th and the 28th was those of us who were at Scott Base in 1979 were extremely well aware of the most amazing coincidence. This is a plaque outside Scott Base, this wooden plinth. And on the top here is a small plaque in memory of Lieutenant Tom Cousins. Tom was the first New Zealander killed in Antarctica, and he was killed on the 19th of November, 1959. A tractor he was driving went into a crevasse. On the 19th of November, and it's more visible here, 1969, 10 years to the day, Jeremy Sykes, a National Film Unit cameraman, was killed in a helicopter crash in Antarctica. And so we were there. 19th of November came and went. And a lot of people, myself included, at Scott Bay said, Phew, well, at least we've got over the 19th of November because 59, 69, 79, we breathed easy. Sadly, little did we know. The day of the crash, Wednesday the 28th of November, we were listening in Scott Base to the radio between what was called Willie's Field, the control tower, and the uh, cockpit staff of the DC-10. And they were coming back and forth and asking, saying, oh, it's a bit cloudy here. What do we do? Where can we go? And there was this discussion. And you often could listen to this in the base. And nobody thought a thing when it disappeared from the radio. Because radio contact in Antarctica was uh, in often, not invariably, but often bad. We had regular 6 o'clock evening radio skids. Uh, the deputy leader was in charge of those in which every field party, near and far, had to ring in, uh, radio in, and say where they were, and it was all okay, and some of them were asked for extra supplies, next time you're out here, or things like that. And sometimes we couldn't get field parties that were very close to us. Uh, they'd often go through Vanda and say, hello Vanda, we can't get Scott Base, can you relay a message? So nobody thought anything when at lunchtime the DC-10 went off the air. Gradually though, during the afternoon, people realized. Mike Preble, our leader at Scott Base, realized very quickly that something was up. He was in touch with uh, the high command at McMurdo and they said, look, you know, they were a little bit worried. And you know, the first instance that I had anything, uh, indication that I had anything was wrong was Mike Preble rushing to the leader's Land Rover, getting in it and driving very rapidly over the hill to McMurdo. Well, by three, four in the afternoon, we knew that something was seriously wrong. Um, after dinner that evening, there was nothing those of us at the base could do. Somebody said, well, we can't do anything. Let's go out to the ski field and continue working on the 
uh, Scott-based ski field. And this is the uh, Hillary A-frame out uh, at the uh, foot of the ski field. And we drove out in this little Swedish track vehicle. Here is a picture of uh, the rope tow uh, that we were installing. Well, something about Antarctica is Antarctica is incredibly quiet. There are no trees. When the wind blows, there's no rustling of leaves. Uh, it's very quiet. It's, it's almost scarily quiet. The night of the 28th of November, 1979, is permanently etched in my mind for the noise. There was the constant drone of planes taking off from Williams Field uh, to search for the missing plane. Helicopters taking off. Planes on the ground warming up. Planes coming in and landing. Uh, it was like no other evening in Antarctica. It was just dominated by ceaseless noise. And it was about 12.30, um, just after midnight, that the news came in that the wreckage had been spotted. And what had happened, of course, and we know this in New Zealand now, uh, is that the plane had thought, because of the computer error, they thought they were coming down here, and it was perfectly safe to come down here. And in fact, this is what happened, and they came and they circled and they crashed into the lower slopes of Mount Erebus. Well, they sent up a helicopter like this uh, the next morning uh, with a US Navy doctor, and she was accompanied by the three New Zealand mountaineers. And the whole aim was to go and see whether anybody had possibly survived the crash. They very quickly determined that nobody had survived the crash at all. Then the effort moved into, okay, now we know we're going to be not rescuing, but recovering. And the first thing that it did was send up helicopters to build a landing pad near the crash site so that uh, when the police from New Zealand, who'd been trained in dealing with a mass disaster and uh, body recovery came down, they, uh, helicopters could land safely and they could build the campsite very near. And so this landing pad was being built. And I was sent up as information office photographer on a plane that left uh, about six in the evening. And I was told, you're taking only Antarctic Division's black and white camera. You're not taking the color camera. Why? Because color film could only be developed at this stage in Australia. You had to send the film to Australia and it could only be developed commercially and they did not want pictures to fall into the wrong hands. And so I went up with black and white and then the whole burden was on my shoulders. I had to make no mistake in developing. What I did was I took two 24 films of black and white and I'm going to show you, these are my contact prints. Uh, and I uh, kept contact prints like one keeps carbon copies of one's stories, if any of you remember what carbon copies are. Uh, and um, uh, here you can see what I have done, is I've actually marked AD and star 3011, because by the time I got back and developed them, it was the 30th of November. AD meant this was a picture I had blown up and sent with the negatives back to Antarctic Division. And there is the picture uh, of, of the long smear. And this, to me, is one of the more poignant ones. You see, I mean, the oil, the mess, and this plane that just skidded up the mountain. There is the tail. Uh, there are some of the wheels. Here is the remainder of the fuselage. Um, then the second contact sheet, and this was the only two films I took, um, contained um, AD 30 here. That picture, uh, that as soon as I saw it, I knew that's the picture that's going to tell the story of the Erebus crash. Uh, and another one that I have marked is that one there, and that's as I took off with the helicopter pilot to go back, having left some mountaineers, and they were signaling it was safe to take off. They were installing the platform and beginning to install the recovery camp. So I went uh, back uh, to the dark room and blew that one up. And that's become, and I knew Instantly, when I saw it on the contact prints, the first view I had, I 
uh, wasn't so perspicacious that I t could tell when I could only see the uh, negatives, the reverse negatives. But as soon as I saw the print, that's the picture. I was really pleased that this picture came up because it clearly, with the Koru symbol and the tail of the DC-10, tells the story immediately. The other thing is, um, you know, it isn't a picture of uh, relatives' bodies can be seen lying around the place. It was a good picture to use. And instantly, within a few days, this was the headline, symbol of the tragedy. I was reading very briefly this morning's New Zealand Herald, and there was a tiny little version of this picture. It's become the picture more than any other that has symbolized the 28th of November, uh, 1979 Erebus crash. I often say, I lectured in political science for 41 years, and long after my 100 plus publications have been forgotten, one thing that may be remembered about me and will live on well after I've been forgotten is my picture of the DC-10's tail. I have no doubts about that. And the fact that it's still appearing on a daily basis in the papers now at the 40th anniversary just shows that. Um, ironically, the Christchurch Press the next day, a big story, because of course the story of the plane came through very late to New Zealand, uh, and the big story in the press was Bird's epic flight to South Pole 50 years ago today. And what an irony that uh, Admiral Bird flew over the South Pole for the first time 49 years and 364 days before the crash. The aftermath. Most people in New Zealand knew of someone who was killed in the crash. And somebody, you know, we're a small country, six degrees of separation, divided in two at least, three degrees at most. Well, this is my who's who at Scott Base, and one of the people on it was Dave Heyman. Dave Heyman was Peter Mulgrew's son-in-law. Dave Heyman was in Antarctica working as a technician for the University of Auckland uh, Zoology Fish Studies. I didn't personally know anybody we knew Dave Heyman. Dave was such a lovely person. Immediately, the personal side also came to Scott Base. Peter Mulgrew was, of course, on Hillary's expedition uh, to the Antarctic in 1957 uh, to 59. And yesterday, I went for the first time to Eden Garden. And uh, way up the top of Eden Garden, if you know that wonderful quarry garden, uh, this is what they call Hillary Height. Uh, it's a bit of a trek up there. And there was a memorial plaque to Peter Mulgrew. Uh, and I took this photo, these photos just yesterday. And I thought, well, how appropriate is that? The first time I'd been there, the first time I'd seen it. We held a memorial service at Scott Base. Uh, and in this photograph, I just want to point out there was uh, a New Zealand uh, priests came down from Papua Nui, there was a, a clergyman from uh, McMurdo, uh, and here is Bill Birch. Bill Bir what happened at the, after the crash is that all VIP programs, many scientific programs that were still to come to Antarctica, were cancelled. Bill Birch, as Minister of Science and representative of the government, was one of the very few people who came down um, as uh, what they call a VIP and he was scheduled to come, and he represented the government personally at the base. We're outside under the flagpole, and I've even kept the order of service, um, and a very traditional order of service, oh God, our help in ages past, and things like that. It was very, very moving. Um, John Blumsky came down for Radio New Zealand, uh, to represent Radio New Zealand, because they immediately said, Nigel Roberts, this puzzling choice can't handle it by himself, and they sent down one newspaper man, uh, one radio man, John Blumsky, and a, a television man, John Knowles, and a television cameraman. They sent down four people to assist in the coverage of the story. Coordinating this became a full-time job for our base leader. So I didn't see Mike for nearly 10 days, and instead Bob Thompson came back to Antarctica and took over the role of base leader. So it impacted on the administration of the base and at the very senior level. For the first time, therefore, I 
was really given sole charge of a VIP. He was a very controversial figure in the time. He was pushing the National Development Act through Parliament. He was seen as you know, the Darth Vader of the National Party. He came down and his people skills were phenomenal. Bill Birch had been a surveyor before he entered, entered politics. He immediately sought out the New Zealand surveyors and asked them about their work. He went out there because this is where uh, Dave Heyman had been working. This was the crew he'd been working with. I was able to take him over to the Dry Valleys to see the University of Waikato's team's uh, work in the Dry Valleys and uh, what they were doing in a, glass, in a greenhouse made out of plastic was showing how even in Antarctica you could grow crops if you protected it from the wind and elementarily from the cold because a greenhouse got very hot. Well, I wasn't up on the crash site again, but Colin Monteith was. Colin Monteith uh, took uh, a camera, a black and white film, and would send me the uh, undeveloped film. I'd go into the darkroom, develop them, and write stories as a result of them. Sometimes get on the radio and say, Colin, what is this picture about? It looks relevant. And as you can see, I've uh, marked some here. And this one in particular is worth seeing. Here is, and you'll see it, there's a New Zealand mountaineer lowering somebody on a rope into a crevasse. Look, covered. There is the picture as it appeared a few days later, December the 5th in the Christchurch Star. So that's exactly a week after the crash. And you can see going down into the crevasse and all the parts uh, spread around. And so that's why you needed the mountaineers on site to make sure that they were safe. Uh, another couple of the pictures that I chose, I said, okay, well, there's a person looking at the black box and looking at the machinery and sent that in, they blew it up sent it in uh, the aircraft engine. Was it an engine fault? We didn't know at that stage what had caused the crash. It was in, uh, completely a mystery. And here just uh, Ted Robinson, who was deputy leader, and just by complete coincidence, he was a police constable in Christchurch, knew many of the police in the recovery team, uh, and he had uh, somebody give him these photos taken in color from the top, and he passed them on to me, just to give you an idea of what it looks like in color, because of course the accident occurred in color and not in black and white. There's the tail from a very close up picture. There's the fuselage and there's looking through the fuselage and look how close the recovery camp is. One of the things we did was two people, Garth Varko and Ted Robinson, built a massive cross. Uh, in the uh, Scott Base workshop. And here they are working on the cross, which they plane, they saw, they uh, joined together. Oh, and on it they put the call sign of the plane that was found in the wreckage, was sent back to us. And uh, ZK NZP was put onto the cross. And we held a service outside Scott Base to bless the cross. Um, there's Garth Varko holding it up. Here are the two ministers still. Uh, Mike Preble there, Bob Thompson, and this is Anne Martindale, who was the US ambassador to New Zealand, and she'd come down um, uh, after the crash. To me, in some ways, the second most amazing trip I went on was to put in the cross. And I went up, and my job was to take photographs of people who knew how to do it. Here we see, we bolted the cross to the rocks of a little noon attack about two kilometers from the crash site and putting in the cross and then uh, put a whole lot of uh, uh, big scoria boulders around it. And here is a picture, a black and white picture I took of a Japanese scientist who came up pouring sake onto the base of the cross site in memory of the Japanese victims who were killed in the crash because there were quite a few Japanese tourists. And this, pa uh, this picture in particular got picked up and has been used a lot, including by Air New Zealand. Here is a black and white picture that I've got, and to go show you the relationship between the cross, I went back off the back of the noon attack, take a picture of the cross, and there you can see, and that's about two kilometers away, and that's the crash site still very, very visible. And I should say, when we were there, putting it in, it was the most amazing experience. This line of clouds would roll up over the crash site, and it'd be hidden. 
we think, is it going to come and roll up over us? We all had survival bags. We had to stay the night if needs be. And then it would recede. And then it would roll up over the crash site. And then it would recede. So half my pictures of the cross don't have the crash site in it. To end, I thought, I'd just leave you with a much nicer view of Erebus. Many, many thanks.